Um, hi, I'm Asher Hartman. I'm an intuitive practitioner, and I'm starting a little series of conversations with friends, with artists, with shaman, uh, with mediums about the question of love um, in this very difficult time. And today I'm talking with Edgar Fabian Frias, a shaman, therapist, artist, protector, being extraordinaire, um, with whom I've had a number of conversations. And today we're going to talk a little bit about um, the question of have you ever struggled with love? I'm feeling loved. Uh, welcome, Edgar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Asher, for asking me to join you and to be a part of this beautiful project. Oh, you're so welcome. I'm really, really, really so grateful that you're here because to my mind, you're a person who's very honest about love, who works with a lot of love, um, for whom people feel a lot of love and who emanates a lot of love. Mm -hmm. um, and so I I'm, I'm curious because for me, love is a very hard thing. Um, it's a very hard concept to grapple with. And I want to be kind of clear that when I'm talking or thinking about love, I'm not necessarily thinking about it in a kind of prosaic terms, I understand that perhaps love is an empty word for a lot of people. It doesn't necessarily have meaning. It's overused. I mean, we use it um, from, you know, from all instances from, you know, I love this candy to I love you and I maybe mean I sort of like you um, to, you know, I love the spirits, which I may indeed love. Um, and so uh, I want to be just clear that we don't have to be sweet, um, that we can be very real about it. And I'm just wondering, have you ever, a person who's been so loved and um, who gives so much love, ever struggled to feel loved? You know, it, it, that question reminds me of my first uh, time going to therapy. Um, I went to therapy because I was feeling a lot of anxiety and I was having a lot of um, panic attacks also. And I remember in my first session, um, my therapist helped just guide me to myself, to my like inner self, my inner experience. And I realized in that session that I was being really mean to myself and really, um, yeah, attacking myself in many ways. And so of course I was feeling like so much anxiety and so much like <laughs> just pain in, in general. And so I think, you know, that to me was a big kind of moment. Um, I remember that like later that day and like I cried so much after I had that experience. And later that day, I remember um, someone gave me a hug and I remember that hug, I just felt like I could feel it more than I ever could. And that to me was one of those like life-changing moments of like, wow, something happened in therapy. You know, <laughs> something happened in that experience that I got to see something about myself and I think, you know, being someone who growing up felt very othered, felt very different. Um, I struggled a lot to like feel seen or feel even like I saw people like me. And so that in many ways led, led to feeling a lot of, yeah, lovelessness or not feeling like people cared about me or not feeling like I was important. And so it's definitely something I think I've gone to a lot of therapy for, and I've done a lot of work on, a lot of healing work, a lot of magic work and energy work. And I think it's also become a strategy too for me to, um, you know, seek connection and seek support and seek community. Mm -hmm. And to know that it almost needs to be something active in my life because I think for, yeah, I think that that was something in many ways, like a story I had was like, I have to find people who see me or, or understand me. And I know like, uh, I, know, I know a lot of like, you know, young folks who feel marginalized or other also have that feeling or that experience of like, I need to find people that will love me for who I am. I mean, it must've been very difficult though to move from, um, you know, feeling difficulty, feeling seen or um, feeling loved and then to move out of yourself to seek connection. How did you do that? I think it was survival. <laughs> um, I, it started early on where I think, you know, there was a moment with my family where, you know, my parents are Spanish speaking mostly and they do speak a little bit of English, but there was like a moment in school, I remember where I kind of like moved beyond um, them being able to support me um, in terms of like academics or in terms of like kind of what the school was demanding of me. 
And um, I think, you know, that kind of started a pattern in some ways of like saying, okay, well, I need to find people that can help me or support me so that I am understanding what's happening. Um, and that I think in some ways kind of led into also like me starting to have passions or interests or um, wanting to explore things that I also felt very like othered and like my family just like didn't get it. And, um, and so I think there was like a moment in my life where I realized like, if I don't, if I don't do this, like I'm gonna just like feel like a freak my whole life, basically. I'm gonna feel like I'm nothing. And I think compounded with that was I also grew up Jehovah's Witness. And so I knew at some point <laughs> I was gonna lose my entire community for being a queer. That was also that survival of like, okay, like if I'm gonna lose everyone I know, maybe even my family, like I have to do something about that. Um, and there was, I think, a part of me, like an inner part of me that I'm really grateful for. And I also see it as part of like a sacred connection that I have with the ancestors and the transestors that could really like support and guide me and be like, no, no, come over here. There's like something else waiting for you. Um, but yeah, but I, I, so I'm grateful to that part of me, definitely. I wonder how you found your community and how you would describe them. And, and my second part was, how did you know that you had the ancestors and transestors with you? There were moments definitely where, um, yeah, like I think that there, I, I'm almost like getting flooded with like a lot of different moments like that come up from when I was a young person. And, you know, for example, like I have an experience that I share often where I was um, with my church group and we were at a park and I was sitting underneath a tree reading a book and just really enjoying it. And they were playing baseball. And the whole group of people came up to me and they were making fun of me for wanting to read a book under a tree, which is like such a normal thing for someone to want to do, right? But because I wasn't playing um, baseball, they kind of saw me as other, they didn't understand me. And, you know, that was a really painful moment, but I remember there kind of just being like a presence there, um, like an energy there that really just reminded me that like, that was what I liked and it was what I was interested in and that that was like, okay. Um, but I feel like that could have definitely been one of those moments, you know? And so I feel like I'm really grateful to that connection. And I think that's what's really also guided me into doing energy work and healing work and supporting other people. It's like, I know I have a direct connection to that, that it's been with me my whole life. And I know how much of a gift that is and how much, you know, in many ways, I think it's a responsibility to also for me to support other people and connecting to that inner part of themselves as well. Oh, absolutely. What you do so deeply and beautifully. Um, and I, I'm curious, though, that energy, how did you because I think it's maybe hard for other people to feel this. How did you know it was something other than you? How did you even feel the energy around you? Do you know what I mean? Because I think spirit, if you will, or energies or beings are are with us, but we don't all feel it or we're not all available to feel it or maybe we doubt it. How did you know th what this energy was? Um, yeah, there's something about the energy that has always felt different. Um, it's always because I think I'm very aware of when I hear like a thought come into my head. Mm. Um, but I feel like there's moments in my life where it's just, I think it's it's very somatic for me. It's very visceral. I feel it kind of reverberate through my entire being. Whereas I think many times when I have like a thought or even like an anxiety or a worry, it can feel very located maybe in this part of my body. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think in those really powerful moments where I've, I've had like intervention <laughs> in some ways by the spirit, by ancestors, transestors, there's been just like a really visceral, almost like reorientation that's happened. Mm -hmm. And it's been like an entire body experience. And I think that that kind of level of reorientation to me is like almost like uh, unquestionable. And so there've been many moments in my life where I've been directed by that voice to do stuff. And I've just been like, what? <laughs> like, but I'm just like, okay, like I'm gonna do it. Because when you feel it, you know it. And you know that that voice does not guide you towards something that's going to harm you. And it's always towards something that's gonna support some sort of unfolding. Yeah. And I use that voice and that connection to that voice so much in the energy work and the therapy work that I do, because I think it is what guides 
towards those moments of um, empathy, healing, opening up, um, transformation, there are these kind of ways that you can kind of sense into that and also that the guides can really support. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I wonder if it's a form of spiritual love, you know, um, and it, it's interesting to me too. I feel the sim similar thing. Like sometimes when I, you know, I'm in my maybe conditioned self where I feel like, oh, nobody loves me, nobody cares about me, or I'm incapable of loving or caring. Um, I do typically feel very connected to spirit in that there's this other being. And sometimes for me, it'll just be a literally a physical being, like one of my like masters or guides, you know, I don't know really the correct terminology for it. They will come and like hold me or enfold me and I will feel loved um, not to be corny about it, but, but that feels like a very different kind of love than the kind that maybe we're used to talking about um, just normally. What does it feel like for you? And is that spiritual love or do you have a connection to spiritual love? Yeah, I think, you know, that reminds me a lot of um, this, you know, something that I do sometimes to remind myself of what you just named, um, is like putting my hands up like this mm -hmm. and just, when I do that, I immediately feel vibration in my hands. Mm -hmm. And to me, that is love. And that is like as something that's like enveloping us and that's connecting us. And, and so it's something I, you know, always return to if I have those moments of feeling disconnection. And so of uh, reminding myself of that energy being present. Um, yeah. And I think that that's like a deep, deep resource that I call upon many times in my life. Um, and it's something that I know will last beyond my body, beyond my connections in this physical dimension. And that's something that is so, yeah, so profound and that it does transcend in many ways um, language and also what, as you're naming the ways that maybe we contextualize what love is. And, and, it's, and I think it's, it really, I think that's also why it feels hard for me to define it because it, um, it moves almost beyond emotion in a, in a strange way. Um, there's definitely emotion there, but I think that feeling of love can encompass so many emotions and it doesn't necessarily always feel good. Um, but I think there's something about it that is um, comforting and grounding. I think that maybe those words come up, comforting mm -hmm. and grounding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, comforting and grounding is maybe essential in this time period because it feels like, well, it doesn't feel like it is such a difficult time period um, where in there's so much grief, so much rage and beneficial rage, I think, um, and an overturning of uh, many positions. And in so doing, there's obviously a tremendous amount of violence and pain. And I wonder for you, not that you should be a cure-all for the times, but how love plays into um, our present and whether it's, you know, what does it look like or feel like uh, to you in, in such a difficult time period where so many people are struggling? Is it, is it part of the present? Yeah, it's profoundly part of the present. I think the things that people are angry about are about ways that love is not being allowed to unfold as it wants to, as it needs to. I think, you know, a lot of the things that people are enraged about are about systems that have brought upon, you know, many communities, violence and alienation and exploitation. And so I think that rage is very much asking, demanding the system to transform. And I really believe it is about expanding our ability to feel empathy for other people, especially those that imperialism, colonization, white supremacy, patriarchy have taught us to not feel empathy for. Um, and also, you know, this moves beyond timelines too. I think it does you know, speak to the way that this system wants us to believe that we're disconnected from this, you know, intense history that really plagues us here in this country. And that like deep denial is really a lack of empathy 
And that is in many ways how the trauma shows up, especially for I think a lot of white people, people who are colonizers, it shows up as a lack of empathy and an inability to connect. And so I think sometimes that rage and that anger, that kind of, you know, I, I feel like there have been so many times where I myself as a person of color, as an indigenous person have been labeled as like the angry person of color. And I know like so many people of color know that feeling. And I think it does come from this deep sense of knowing that things are not right, that things need to transform and change. And also that the tactics and the tools and the um, defense mechanisms that have been put in place are not allowing love to unfold in the way it needs to. And, you know, capitalism isn't love, imperialism isn't love, it's all, and it's created these entire systems that have shaped our cognition and perception and understanding of one another. And so there is like a deep need for transformation. And so I really link this all in many ways to empathy and connection. Um, and we need that rage to kind of be able to shift these really stagnant systems that refuse to, to transform. Yeah, I was going to ask you, is there love in rage? Yes. I yeah. agree. Yeah, I agree. I, it's, it's, it's such an important thing to not look at the rage as toxic or poisonous. There are versions of toxic and poisonous rage that we're not necessarily discussing at the moment. But there, sometimes love does feel like an energy force that has to come through in this way. And when it's directed particularly by communities toward liberation, freedom, and revolution, then it feels like love to me. Um, but it doesn't always feel like that coming through your body. And I wonder for you if, because um, I mean, not to put you on the spot, but so many people look to you th for guidance. And I know um, you've given a lot of guidance in your practices. Um, what do people do with that rage, even if it is a, um, a version of love, when it's coming through the body, what, uh, what, what works, what, what feels right? You know, I think, you know, definitely I want to make space for people to have process, their own process, right? I think everyone is in different stages of coming to terms with the reality of the world that we live in. And so I think that's gonna show up in different ways for people. Um, I think there are ways to express, to channel, to catalyze that anger, that rage, to allow it to move you in directions and to allow it to maybe dissolve um, fear inside of you. There's so, so many things that rage can really support, you know, and also to listen to the rage. I think that can be really powerful to see what this emotion is wanting to teach how it's wanting to guide. Um, and then, in, and I think finding ways to move that energy, to not allow it to stay inside of you. And that can be done through like movement, through somatic work, through creation of media. I think for myself, my art practice is that sanctuary where I move a lot of that rage into and also create things that for me help me have a sense of more of, um, of agency and also of impact. And you know, that's definitely what's inspired me to do spell work constantly. I think a lot of my spells come from rage, come from moments of, yeah, feeling like I need to do something and feeling like I need to really set an intention, set a boundary. Mm. And, you know, I notice a shift in my being. And I think lots of times I make these um, spells in the morning when I'm kind of just like sitting with the news or sitting and processing with what's happening or what happened the day before. And so I definitely feel like finding ways to move that energy and everyone has ways to kind of move that energy through their body. And I think intuitively you kind of know what works for you. And so really, you know, and that could also be doing political work, talking to a family member who is also kind of maybe espousing some hurtful things and having like a difficult conversation and letting that rage guide that, um, but also staying connected. And I think that that's what's really difficult is it's hard to stay connected when people don't have empathy for us or where they don't refuse to see us or refuse to even open up their hearts a little bit. And sometimes that rage can also mean setting boundaries and not talking to people again too. 
So I think like listening to that rage and noticing that it is wanting to help you too. And, and I think that listening and kind of understanding what it's wanting to say can be really supportive and can help you make decisions that can really shift the direction of your life. You know, and I know for myself, I've had many moments of rage and anger and, um, I've noticed that they've been many times they've been kind of wanting to like, you know, again, that reorientation, right? That could be a very loving reorientation of like, you know, maybe you've been working in this specific way, but now here's another direction that's emerging for you. And I've noticed when I've done that, um, yeah, things have really shifted in really profound ways. I can think of like, <laughs> I can think of some jobs I've had where I've had that rage come up with um, problematic leadership. And that's catalyzed me to start to communicate with other coworkers about it, to start to organize outside of work and start to make plans on how to challenge um, these systems, right? Or these people who are in positions of power who shouldn't be in positions of power. And I, you know, in one, one case, I literally helped, you know, um, ha an executive director step down from a position when they were exploiting um, the finances of an institution um, that worked with uh, communities with developmental disabilities. And so that in that moment, you know, I could have sat with the rage because that came from a lot of rage of just being exploited at work as a social worker, um, seeing a lot of the communities I was working with being exploited. Um, but in that case, I did something and it, and it did kind of guide me through a process and, and invite people into that process that, <laughs> that ended up with a really powerful resolution that I feel really happy about. And it did, it very much felt like it was something I was being guided to do as well. That's so beautiful. I love the way that you entwine this sense of being guided, your relationship with, you know, what we maybe could call the divine or spirit or, and with community and with love and rage and the way that they um, feel together as they're so entwined, so beneficial, and so, um, you know, um, expansive, you know. Um, I'm so grateful for you and, uh, and your work and who you are and all the, everything that you do every day, literally every day, all day <laughs> in the world. Um, you're, you're just such a beautiful being and I love you very, very much. Love you too, Asher. I'm so, I'm so grateful to be connected to you and I'm so grateful to have known you for such a long time. You are definitely one of those people that I felt, finally felt seen by as a young person, you know, and I think that that's definitely, you know, I think talking about like queer love <laughs> and how, you know, something I love about queer love is that like it moves beyond like blood ties and it allows us to redefine how we see connection, how we see family. Um, and, you know, and I think that's why I also have like a lot of people that come to myself as well. I think, you know, I definitely feel a responsibility for other queer, transgender, expansive people where I know that we're part of a web and we're part of a sacred web and then we care for each other. Um, and we find each other and we come to each other, we're drawn to each other. And so mm -hmm. that to me is also love, that mm -hmm. field of energy that connects us and that has connected us beyond time and space. And I definitely mm -hmm. am so grateful to yeah, the guides that brought us together and that are also bringing people together through us as well. Because I feel like we've also, you know, we're connected to such a beautiful community of people. Oh my gosh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's just so many beings, you know, across maybe the, the globe that we're connected to. Um, and I feel those people every day um, in my practice and in my art practice. And yeah, I'm very, very grateful. I'm very, very grateful to be on this planet with you at this time. I'm, um, honestly, you know, I know so many people feel the same. So. <laughs> <laughs> same, yeah. I know yeah. we're so blessed to know each other in this time and to be connected to so many divine people that yeah. are a part of our web. Yeah, and I think, I guess my little parting piece might be like, because I, I know that a lot of people feel that they should be or are or can be connected, but they're not exactly sure where their place is, you know, especially younger people struggling to find, you know, their little piece of the web, which changes all the time. It's always in fluctuation. And I'm wondering, because you are such a guide to so many, if, if and maybe even referencing, you don't have to, but your own experience of finding your group, you know, people that you connected with, 
I mean, it's, it's, I'm sorry to ask you this question, but you know, it's the, one of those, what would, advice would you give qu questions to people who at whatever stage of their life are looking for connection? Yeah, I think, you know, understanding that it's something that, as you were saying, is going to fluctuate and that there are going to be moments where you don't feel connected and to allow those moments to help um, guide you also, because I think that for myself, I'm very much, you know, it makes me think of, you know, when I lived in Portland, Oregon, I started a queer music, a queer and trans music and arts festival. And the main reason behind that was because I felt so isolated. And I also felt so many people say they felt isolated too. And I think, you know, letting that yearning and that desire for connection to guide you and to help you transform and to also not wait for people to make that opportunity for you and to find ways to kind of create that opportunity for yourself and to also um, find accomplices, you know, find people that can support you in that process and know that, um, yeah, that they're out there. Because I think that that's something yeah, something that I've experienced in my life and something that, you know, I heard growing up as a young person. And this is another one of those moments where the ancestors and ancestors came to support me. I, I heard growing up, like, you won't find friends if you leave your town. You won't find friends if you leave your community. And, you know, I felt so alienated as a young person in a, um, in a community where there were the only other queer people were seen as like pariahs. Um, so I, when I heard that, you know, a voice deep inside of me was like, no, 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 your friends and your family are out there. You just need to go find them. Mm -hmm. um, and in this specific experience, um, I was, I, I was going to study abroad in England and literally what my um, guides told me was just like, walk, just walk, 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 walk as much as you can. And like on the third day of walking around the city aimlessly, quote unquote, um, <laughs> I found um, a flyer for a music show and I went to that show. And at that show, I made my first queer anarchist friend who um, introduced me to an entire community. And so all of a sudden I had a huge community of queer and trans anarchist people who understood me, you know, who found me attractive, who found me interesting, who didn't think I was a fucking weirdo, you know, um, who saw me as themselves. And so they're out there, you know, and some time take a moment to, to find them, but to also know that we have support and to listen for those moments where your guides are, you know, wanting to direct you in a specific direction. Thank you so much, Edgar. Thank you. It's been really so generous of you to be here and to be a part of this project. Um, you, you're the, absolutely the first person I, I would think of when I think of love, so there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so oh my much. Gosh, Asher. Yeah, I'm so excited to see the other people as well. I'm excited to see, um, yeah, how other people have this conversation and the expansion of what love means and also how it's deeply connected also to our pain and to our suffering and our alienation too, you know. <laughs> I think that's so important. Otherwise, it's fairly meaningless, you know? It's empty. Yeah. Thank you, Edgar. Yeah, thank you, Asher. Thank you. <laughs>